Okay, uh, the exam next Wednesday, and like I said over the note, uh, we will start early. Not that I'll try to make it longer than the exam should be passed. Again, I'm going to try to not really even look at those, um, but just in case you need more time, because I know some people uh, take tests more slowly than others. Plus, next Wednesday, we'll be reviewing next Monday um, and talking about what to expect. I, I probably, well, I might start writing it over the weekend, but I probably won't finish it. Um, so probably during Monday's class, by reviewing, I'll sort of be reviewing in my own mind the kinds of things that I might want to put out. In. So <coughs> that's what the plan will be. Today we're doing... Well, I thought it'd be good to outline part of the proof of the fundamental theorem for cyclic groups. FTCG stands for the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups. I won't outline the entire proof, but part of it. We'll look more into permutation groups, both in lecture A and B. And then in lecture B, we'll start the idea in a more precise fashion of what, the, what an isomorphism of groups is. Okay, so we'll be more precise than we have been so far. So here's an outline. What, what part are we going to outline the proof of? We're going to outline the proof of the fact that any subgroup of a cyclic group must itself be cyclic. Let me go ahead and just write that part off on the board. Let G be a cyclic group. And let H be a subgroup of G. Then H is also cyclic. So any subgroup of a cyclic group is itself cyclic. That's what we're going to outline the proof of here. It's not too hard once you've got the outline. And I suppose thinking about the exam, I could ask about this. Probably I would give you help because to do it completely cold from scratch would probably be too much. But each individual step is not terribly difficult. First of all, you've got to say, OK, G is cyclic. So what does that mean? It means it's got to generate. Let A be a generator of G. And let H be a non-trivial subgroup trivial subgroup containing just the identity is cyclic. So we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so G is generated by A, and again, H is assumed to be a subgroup of G. We want to show H has some generator. Now, if H equals G, then A would be its generator, but, you know, it's going to be more challenging in general because H might not equal G. So it might not have A as a generator, but it should have some power of A as a generator is the, the main idea. The first step is to show there's a positive power of A that's in H. Certainly, since G is generated by A, and by definition, this was the set of all powers of A, as those powers raised, um, ranged over the integers, both positive and negative, certainly all elements of H are powers of A, but they could be, theoretically, just negative powers of A, a priori. How do you show that it's got at least a positive power of A? Well, if it did have a negative, only a negative power of A initially, say, if A to the T was an H where T is negative, then by closure, A to the negative T, where negative T would be positive, would be an H. H is a subgroup. Closure of the operation in H is going to imply that the inverse of A to the T which is a to the negative t is also going to be an h. Where if t is negative, then negative t is positive. So 
Again, elements of H definitely have to be powers of A because every element of G is a power of A and H is a subgroup of G. The only issue as far as verifying this is, well, what if there are only negative powers? The answer is there can't be only negative powers because if a given negative power is in H, then A, the, its inverse would also be H in H by floating since H is assumed to be a subgroup. Why is that important? Well, it helps set us up to apply the well-ordering principle. Remember the well-ordering principle way back in chapter zero? What does it say? Does anybody remember? I suppose I could ask you to say what the well-ordering principle is on this thing. In the format, there's a small comment. Close. It doesn't have to be a finite set, but it does need to be, according to the statement, a set of positive integers as a smallest element. Actually, you can generalize that to saying a set of all integers above some lower bound, which could be negative, would have a smallest integer in it. But it's stated for us as um, for any given set of positive integers, I guess I almost said it there, there is a least positive integer in the set. So since we verified that a to a positive power some positive power is definitely an H. If we consider the set of all possible positive powers, call it S, the set of all possible, possible positive powers with the property that A to the N is an H. I'll say that here. I'm saying it wrong here. S is the set of all N in the positive integers with the property that a to the n is in h. That's not empty by what we just said in the previous bullet. And therefore, by the well-ordering principle, that has a least element. Let m be the least integer in s. So a to the n is in h by definition of what f is. And would be the smallest positive power of a that's in h. Then the idea is a to the m must be a generator of h. And to verify that, you end up applying the division algorithm. Or it seems like our favorite thing to apply. That and maybe the GCD is a linear combination theorem. Apply the division algorithm. How? Well, certainly. Certainly this is true, and you can also write this. Certainly that's true, because A to the M, by definition, is in H, and therefore, by closure, the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the M is a subgroup of H. But how do you show the other way? And I guess I'll write that as a set inclusion, though I could write that. You'd have to say, give me an arbitrary element of H. I need to show it's a power of A to the M. Give me an arbitrary B, say, an H. Show it's a power of A to the M. Well, B is an H, which is a subgroup of G, so B definitely is a power of A. But is it a power of A to the M? Get the difference there. B is definitely. I'm assuming it's an H, which is a subgroup of G. So it's definitely a power of A because A generates G. The question is, though, is it a power of A to the M? <coughs> I think the book writes B is, say, A to the K. What do you do? You, do, you apply the division algorithm. You take K and divide it by M and see what happens. K is going to be some quotient Q times M plus some remainder. If we could show that remainder is zero, we would be done, wouldn't we? Maybe you need a power of property of exponents here. We should write it like that. Right there. this point. Um, 
goal would be to show that r is zero. Solving for a and the r is the best thing to do. Take a look at what we did here. Yeah, essentially they do solve for a to the r. <coughs> a to the r would then be multiplying both sides by a to the negative qm power. You could write it like that. And this right here is b which is an H, and this right there is again a power of M, which is also an H. Right? We know this. We know that fact. This is an H. And this is an H. H is a subgroup of G. Therefore, the product is an H by closure. But wait a minute. Remember that important thing about the remainder in the division algorithm? It's got to be between 0 and the thing you're dividing by, in this case M, possibly including 0, but not including the thing you're dividing by. But m was defined to be the smallest, the least positive integer, such that a to the m is an h. And I've just verified that a to the r is an h, where r is less than m. The only way that can happen is if r is 0, because of the definition of m. r must be 0 by definition of m. And that means, then, Ultimately, that b is the power of a to the m, a to, b. A to the m to the q. Okay? Tricky enough that if I asked you to do this from scratch on an exam, it'd probably be too difficult. But maybe I'd get you part of the way there and I'd give you a hint about the rest of the way or something. I do that sometimes. I don't think I did that on the old exams, but it's a possibility. I think next Monday we'll look at uh, proving the other parts of the fundamental theory of facilities. All right, again, the main focus today is on permutations and ultimately isomorphisms. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to quickly review the facts that we've talked about for permutations. Depending on how the time goes, we'll either start doing calculations before the quiz or we'll do them a lot after the quiz. We're going to do, we're going to study S4 in particular in depth, okay? Empirically, we're not going to prove things about it. We will do calculations, think about orders, think about subgroups, that kind of thing. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly overview the facts. You can just listen, perhaps, if you want, because you can probably write these down. So once again, what is a permutation? A permutation is a function. Not just any function, though. It's a function from a set to itself. That's one to one and on to. If you consider collections of such, such functions, they can form a group if you have closure. So the composition of any two permutations is another permutation in that set. You always have associativity with function composition. That's no problem. The identity element, the identity mapping, right, maps every element to itself is a permutation. And every inverse of a given permutation in the set also has to be in the set. That's what a permutation group is. It's, it's a set of permutation that form, permutations that forms a group under function composition. Again, our most common example is when A is finite. We're taking it for simplicity to be the first n positive integers, but it could be any collection of n objects. It could be a collection of n people, or n colors if there were enough colors, or And functions, actually we'll talk about situations where the objects we might want to permute are functions. 
can be anything. That's the most common thing that we think about. The symmetric group is the set of all possible permutations on the given set. The symmetric group of degree n, or the symmetric group on n objects, and it's denoted by Sn. Emphasis on the word all. The symmetric group has got to have all the permutations of that set, all the functions that are 1 to 1 and 9 to from that set to itself. And again, by your fundamental counting principle, sometimes called the multiplication rule, the order of Sn is n factorial. We have our example S3 that we looked at. It's got three factorial or six elements. And it turns out if you, for example, define alpha to be this cycle that goes from 1 to 2, then 2 to 3, then 3 back to 1, which in cycle notation, could be represented either as 1, 2, 3, or as 2, 3, 1, or as 3, 1, 2. Those are all represent the exact same permutation. Beta cycles just between 2 and 3. This is alpha here. You could really look like that or like this. Okay. This is called the 3 cycle. This is called the 2 cycle. They were not the only choices I could have made for alpha and beta in order for this to be true, in order for them to generate. I could have picked alpha to be any one of the <coughs> cycles, of which there are two of them. So the alpha that I happen to pick there happens to be this one. But that's also a three cycle right there. I could have picked that for alpha. Beta happened to be this two cycle that permuted 2 and 3, but I could have had beta permute 1 and 2, as this <coughs> one does, or 1 and 3, as this one does. And I would have had the same result. If nothing else, but it, just the arbitrariness of the symbols. Okay, we think of the numbers 1 through n in an order. It's easiest for us to think about. We, but we wouldn't have to use the exact order that we naturally think about. different order if we wanted to. It's not a good idea to do from a pedagogical standpoint, but it's something that theoretically could be done. So it's not the only possibility, but it's what the book happened to think, so I picked it too. Using those relations as we saw last time, you can generate the Cayley table for S3. Okay, we saw how to do calculations. That's definitely something you should be able to do, including for the exam, is do calculations involving relations like this. Maybe let's do one more example. Say I was trying to simplify something like this. Alpha to the fifth, beta cubed, alpha squared, beta. I was trying to simplify some sort of expression like that. Use the fact that alpha has order 3 and beta has order 2. I could replace alpha to the fifth with alpha squared and beta cubed with beta. And now we're back to the situation where we, it's one of the examples we looked at last time where we have something, we have alpha squared beta quantity squared, really, which is going to be the identity, but let's verify it once again. Use the third relation there. Write beta alpha squared as, say, beta alpha times alpha. And then use the fact that beta alpha is alpha squared beta. Make that replacement. There you have an alpha to the fourth. Alpha has order three, so alpha to the fourth is going to be the same as alpha to the first. So this simplifies to alpha beta times alpha beta, the square of alpha beta, which is also the identity, but let's continue. Replace beta alpha with alpha squared beta. So you're left with an alpha cubed beta squared. Those are both the identity 
does simplify to the identity. So you should be able to do calculations like that using facts like this as well. We've got some generators of the group, alpha and beta, and they satisfy certain relations, certain equations that help us simplify the expressions like you see over there. Does it look good to people? Did I make any mistakes? Good? Okay. We did observe last time that that Cayley table seems kind of familiar. It's got the same kind of structure as the Cayley table for D3, the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. The three cycle um, alpha acts like R120. Alpha squared is like R240. Then alpha cubed is back to the identity. You've got just R's here, just like you have epsilons and alphas here. You have just R's down here as well, just like you have just epsilons and alphas in here. Epsilon in powers of alpha. The other things, beta, alpha, beta, alpha squared, beta, act like your flips, your reflections, V, D, and D prime. So you have those combinations that involve the beta down here and up here, just like you have V, D, and D prime down here and up here. It's not a proof that they're isomorphic, though it does seem like they match up well. I don't see any discrepancies if you make these identifications. In fact, what an isomorphism really is, is it's a mapping of a function that's one to one and onto from a group to another group, from to say S3 to D3, that effectively does match up the Cayley tables. You map epsilon here to R0, map alpha to R120, map alpha squared to R240, beta to V, alpha beta to D, and alpha squared beta to D prime. That's going to be a one-to-one -one and onto function that preserves the structure of the Cayley table. Called operation preserving, and that means it satisfies a certain equation. It's going to be similar to what linear transformations satisfy from linear algebra. That's a similar idea. We'll get to that in lecture B. In lecture A, we only have time to review these things. We'll do calculations in lecture B. There are these facts that you should remember for the exam, in case you need them. First of all, every permutation can be, of a finite set can be written as a cycle or as a product of disjoint cycles. So. Say we are in S4. I guess we will do a calculation here initially for S4. And say you've got a permutation that is the product of um, maybe 1, 2, 3 with 1, 2. Maybe 1, 2, 4. Why don't we do it like that? That's not a cycle because it's the product of two cycles. But maybe after simplification, after actually doing the product, we can either write it as a cycle, a single cycle, or the product of disjoint cycles, meaning disjoint having no numbers in common, no objects in common. Remember that when you do this calculation, you are working from right to left because it's function composition overall. But then within each cycle, you go from left to right until you get to the end when you go back to the beginning. So for example, figure out what one gets mapped to under the composition. Start on the right one here. One gets mapped to two. Plug two into the other one, that means two gets mapped to three. So ultimately, under the composition, one gets mapped to three. Then ask what three, what happens to three? The first permutation on the right there, moving from right to left, doesn't move three. It stays constant maps 3 to 3. But then the second one maps 3 to 1. What about 2 and 4? This one maps 2 to 4, and this one keeps 4 fixed, so 2 does need to get mapped to 4. Does 4 indeed get mapped back to 2? You, you should check that. This one maps 4 to 1, go back to the beginning, and this one maps 1 to 2. So yes, 4 does get mapped to 2. We have now written this product of two permutations as the product of two disjoint cycles. 
Again, I think it's best with this, I mean, you can certainly read the proofs in this section, the, the abstract proofs, but I think as far as understanding it, it's fine just to consider examples, okay? The examples can help you believe it. Disjoint cycles commute. One, three, then two, four, meaning right to left, actually you apply this one first and that one is the same as this. Non-disjoint cycles, in general, do not commute. If I switch these around, we should probably get a different answer. The original cycles are not disjoint. They have one and two in common. If I figure out what this is, it probably is going to be different. Go from right to left, one gets mapped to two, then two gets mapped to four, so one gets mapped to four. Already we see it's different. Go from right to left, four does get mapped back to one. Two gets mapped to three, which stays fixed. Double check, does three get mapped to two? Well, first three gets mapped to one, but then one gets mapped to two, so three does get mapped to two. It's easy to sort of zone out as you're listening to me talk, and you're like, what was that again? Well, you know, if you pay attention, you can do this. Okay, you gotta pay attention well, be careful, try to avoid mistakes. When a uh, permutation is in disjoint cycle notation, the order of it is easy to figure out. The order of a permutation that is of a finite set written in disjoint cycle form is the LCM, the least common multiple of the lengths of the cycles. So the order of these permutations here you don't look at this one because that's not disjoint cycle notation. They have one and two in common. The order is not the LCM of three and three. It's not three. These forms are disjoint cycle notation. They have length two. The LCM of two and two is two. The order of both of these permutations is two. When you square it, you're going to get back to the identity. Maybe that's worth checking in this case. Writing out four permutations like this. I help you believe that you really are going to get the identity. Everything should get mapped to itself ultimately. Okay, so pay attention closely. Here I go from right to left. One gets mapped to two, then it gets mapped to three. It stays fixed at three, gets mapped back to one. So one does get mapped to one. Now try two. 2 gets mapped to 4, stays at 4, gets mapped to 1, gets mapped back to 2. So 2 is getting mapped back to itself. How about 3? Three? 3 stays fixed, gets mapped to 1, gets mapped to 2, gets mapped to 3. How about 4? Four? 4 gets mapped to 1, which gets mapped to 2, which gets mapped to 4, which stays fixed. So ultimately 4 does get mapped to itself too. Also, I should say. It's good to double check those things. Help people leave these theories. As a more extreme example, say we're considering a permutation, oh, I don't know, in S11. That's written in disjoint cycle notation. Use seven so far. Well, let's go one more there. If a number's got two digits, you probably should put commas in there. The book does that. Where am I left with? Ten and nine. Anything else? Six. Okay, didn't pick the greatest example. The order of this would be the LCM of three, five, and three, which would be 15. The order of this thing. So you have to raise that to the 15th power before you get back to the identity. 
it's going to generate a cyclic subgroup of order 13 in S11. Which S11, 11 factorial, I think is already <coughs> over a million. There's over a million elements in this group. Its order is over a million. Does that sound right? I think 10 factorial might be 300,000. Does that sound right? Maybe that's 3 million something. It's really big. It's over a million, for sure. Every permutation can be written as a product of two cycles, it turns out. And there's this little trick that you should know to help you write any given permutation as a product of two cycles. Give me an arbitrary permutation. Say this one here. To write it as a product of two cycles, here's what you can do. I think this is right. You can start with the first element and put the last element. There's a two cycle. Again, start with the first element, put the second to last element. Object, I should probably say, it's not an element of the group. Put the first element again and put the third to last one. Put the first element again and the fourth to last one, etc., until you don't have any more, which we now don't have. And this should be one way to represent this cycle, this five cycle, as a product of two cycles. They are not disjoint two cycles. Check it. Two gets mapped to five, which stays fixed. Yes. Five gets mapped to two, which then gets mapped to seven, and then seven stays fixed. 7 stays fixed, then gets mapped to 2, then gets mapped back to 3, stays fixed. 7 does get mapped to 3 ultimately. 3 stays fixed there, there, gets mapped to 2, then gets mapped to 1. 3 does get mapped to 1. Does 1 get mapped to 2? Yes, stays fixed, 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 then gets mapped to 2. So there we have written that 5 cycle is a product of 2 cycles, an even number of 2 cycles. And that means it's what's called an even permutation, which is really important. It's perhaps the most important thing in this section, ultimately for applications of this stuff at least. Thinking about even and odd permutations. Whenever you write a permutation that is a product of two cycles, its parity must be constant, meaning it must be an even number of two cycles or an odd number of two cycles. Because of that, any individual permutation is either labeled an even permutation or an odd permutation. And the set of all even permutations under function composition is also a group with a subgroup of Sn. It's called the alternating group of degree n, denoted by An, and it has half the number of elements. There are the same number of even permutations as there are odd permutations in Sn. That's why An has half the number of elements. Not proving that, but that's something to, to know. The alternating group is plenty important as well. Okay? AN and SN are very important groups. We'll do more calculations after the quiz. Let's take the quiz now.